Hello and welcome to tutorial number five. So in this case, as you go to the web page, here you will have all the materials, the videos, and you will be able to, to download the case, case presentation, the ANSYS project, the Fluent case, and then the meshes, clean meshes and the settings you want to do a, everything from scratch. So this is an interesting case. It's relatively easy, but it will take a long time to run because now we move to an steady. Okay. So, uh, we have done everything so far steady which is relatively fast on a steady, nothing changed. Okay. It's pretty much the same thing, but the difficult thing is that you need to run for longer times so until you get a solution that is statistically steady or statistically significant. And just to show you what we're going to do. Okay. Let me pass here to the presentation. So this is a geometry we have. It's a super easy geometry. So I guess we are not going to have problems doing this in using design model or space plane. I'm going to show you something else as well, just to how to do it in 3d. Even if the, if the case, if the case is 2d, we can do it 3d adding a, doing a, a sweat mesh, a sweat mesh with, with one cell in the set set coordinate. I will show you that. But anyway, because here we have, uh, our dimensions on the domain. Uh, now we go external dynamics also. So see that I'm giving you, uh, dimensions in the previous case in the pipe, our, we were, our geometry were fixed here. The, the geometry is not fixed. It's up to you. So usually in external aerodynamics, the best advice is to have a domain that is as large as possible, but we know that that comes with a price. But generally speaking, the guideline that you should follow is that you shouldn't have a strong gradients in the boundary. Okay. So if we run this case, you will see that here, there are not a strong velocity pressure gradients in these walls. Okay. So that is the general guideline. And usually what you can do is you have your system, a characteristic lens. In this case will be the, the diameter the cylinder and you can go 10, 10 times this length. Okay. Up, down in front and re in the back part, you can go from 15 to 20. Okay. So you can follow these guidelines. If you start to see that you have some interaction between the flow close to, to the, to the body and the bond that is double those dimensions. Okay. But that is, you said it works fine. So here also we have the properties, what we're going to do. We're going to work in compressible and asking you, we're going to use Reynolds similarity now. So you, what I'm going, what we're going to do, to do is fix density and the inlet velocity to one. And then I just viscosity to get your Reynolds number. So here you are free to choose any Reynolds number, but interesting to see here that in this case, depending on the Reynolds number, we can have very similar behaviors. Okay. So you can go for a steady and steady regimes and laminar turbulent regimes. Okay. So while running also sample leaf and drag coefficients, also sample velocity on the way of the cylinder and choose a turbulence model with appropriate, uh, boundary initial conditions. It's up to you. Okay. So at this point, this is what we have. Uh, regarding the physics. So see that we have low Reynolds number. So you saw the here, the, 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 the critical Reynolds number is about 46. So is the Reynolds number below this one? See that you have a steady flow. Okay. So just to remind you that in this case, this is the section rather than the rule. Okay. Industrial applications, you have some steadiness. In this case, we have a strong on steadiness, but if you, you are doing uh, aerodynamic slender bodies, you are not going to have this strong shedding. Okay. You have some on steadiness, but it's not that strong. But in this case, in this geometry, okay, this is a section we are going to have an a uh, strong, strong on a stainless stain. So see that for a Reynolds number up to kind of 150, there are different criteria 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 here, but let's say that up to 150 is on a steady flow and everything is laminar. Okay. Then above 150 is the transitional regime. And then you start to have a wake, uh, turbulent boundary layer turbulence. So you, you, you have, while the flow is separate, it's, uh, it's laminar, then the separation point, everything becomes turbulence and so on. Okay. So you see very different regimes. So at this point, it's up to you to choose uh, Reynolds number. I recommend you to go for on a steady turbulent. This is what, we're, what, what we're doing. And what is inter interesting about this one also is that in this case, there is plenty of numerical and experimental data for validation. Okay. Probably you have one across this plot. So here you have, for instance, the CD versus our Reynolds number. So there are many references. So here putting this one. Okay. And then we have a straw her number as well. Okay. So usually you can average the struggle number, something about zero two. Okay. But you have 
different a lot of sources for 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 validation and here i'm just showing you some numerical values so see here in this part is the the laminar stated region so here you measure cd but also the length of the recirculation bubble this okay and then you move to on a steady okay so will be kind of laminar and turbulent and we have these values but you can go even higher okay so you have to adhere some references again there are many 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 references so the mesh this is our mesh okay so it's relatively easy mesh there is not a big deal and nevertheless i will show you how to do it and just to show you some results so all the results that we're going to see corresponds to reynolds number in on a state and turbulent region okay if i would recall it's 1000 so see what, what is happening here we have velocity and pressure so see that you have an onset of instability and you have this strong shedding. Okay, so we have your velocity and your pressure field and where you have the lowest pressure will be the core of the vortex. Now we move and we look to, let's say this artificial fields, turbulent kinetic energy. Here is what it's telling you where you have the fluctuations and this is the vorticity that is giving you where you have the, 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 the vortices. So in this case, as we look at, the, at this vorticity component, this will tell you the sense of rotation of the vortex. So this is counterclockwise, clockwise, okay? So all this information can be computed. Then we move here and this is interesting as well. We have the instantaneous velocity field and the mean velocity. Okay. So see that here you have the time. Okay. This is time accurate. Previously in the steady case, we are not solving time. We are advancing the solution somehow that later we're going to see how we do we control the advancement of the solution. In this case, we have time and it's time accurate. So See that as you have instantaneous field, it's also in a steady, uh, on a steady simulation, you should also compute mean statistic. You should average and see that we're averaging. And this is, this is interesting to see because this is also a good, uh, criterion to start your simulation. As you run your simulation and when you look at the, Contours of velocity of pressure and you see that they are not oscillating anymore You can say that you have reached a statistical steady simulation and see here that if I run again You will see that the beginning but then probably after 50 seconds the solution is not changing anymore So I can say that I can at 50 seconds I can let it run a little bit more to sample more data and that will be the range where I'm going to that I'm going to, to use to do all my, my statistical analysis Okay so for instance, in this case, now we have here the pressure force in the direction X and Y important. I'm just showing you the pressure component. Remember that, <clears throat> that the force you can div divide in a pressure component and also in a viscous component here, we're looking just at the pressure component and see that different behaviors. And from here, you can see that there is a characteristic shedding frequency. Okay, so here we have again the fields. So all this stuff can be measured. And what I was telling you that in about 50 seconds, see that here there is an initial transient. Okay, so you can you cannot stop the simulation here because it still is not a statistically steady. So you let it run a little bit up to kind of 40 or 50 seconds. And from this point on, you see that everything is kind of repeating. Okay, it's statistically steady. So we can say that starting from 50 up to 100, I will take all this period to do all my statistics. So I can compute mean values. Okay, I can compute here also the power spectrum. I can compute dominant frequencies. You can do all that in the range where you have the, the your signal is repeating. Uh, so it's interesting also. So if you are doing optimization usually or designing something using CFD, usually you don't use the the instantaneous value because for every instant in time you will see that you have a different condition especially if you have a strong on steadiness so usually we look at mean values okay so usually when you're run, running on a steady also you are computing your mean quantities and you focus in your, your in those mean mean values so here again mentioning how to sample it in the wake so in this case i put one point but remember you can put many points in the whole domain usually you put it where you have the fluctuations and here we're sampling velocity x and y component and see here that you can start to see that there is a correlation in these components okay so later you can we start to see advanced post-processing we're going to see that and see that here you see that you have y velocity positive or negative that is telling you that it's passing a vortex there and then it's going out and going down the components and here also see that it, you have uh, an oscillations so around a mean value so it will be the standard deviation or variance okay 
So all this stuff, all this stuff can be done. And then also you can put a line and sample, and s s sample whatever you want in that line. So in this case, see that I'm sampling X velocity and pressure, okay? So see that pressure remains always negative, meaning that in here, in this region, you can measure there, you have a vortex that is always passing. And then see that is the red line, the pressure, and see the, the blue line represents the velocity that is will be an analogy to momentum. And see that here you can see in one point you have positive and negative momentum, okay? But generally speaking, if you average this, this wake will be, uh, <clears throat> it will produce drag, okay? It will be a momentum deficit, not surface, okay? Uh, surface. Uh, so all this stuff, you can do it in a uh, simulation. So as you see, it's a lot of stuff to do now. You need to sample a lot of data. We're going to see certain the case how to, to do the animations, everything. But that is just pretty colors. But it's important sampling, very important sampling in points and forces. Okay, always sam sample that. So after that, then we have the signal. So here, so previously I was showing you everything within Fluent. Now we go external software in this case and using Python. So see the signal so you can have the signal in function of iterations, okay? So drag lift coefficient, but also we have here the residual. So this is what I have stressed also, that don't look always at the residuals because the residuals, there are not a direct indication that you are converging well, or it's a good solution. So see that at the beginning is going down, okay? And some people tend to, say, to think that when this happens, that it goes up, your solution is diverging. It's not diverging, this is just an indication that you have it's strong and steadiness, and from iteration to iteration, the solution is changing a lot, okay? So this is the fact that you have here. So it's difficult to judge uh, convergence here or accuracy by looking at residuals. Instead, when you look at those signals, here it's easier to judge your, your the quality of your convergence. So here we have in function of iterations and time, okay? Drag lift coefficient, and you can do your signal processing. And just to mention that this case, even if you have these strong iterations, you, we can run an steady solver with no problem. But the steady solvers, the physics, as you have an strong on steadiness, is not accurate what you are going to compute. But a steady solvers, the, the fact that a steady solver is called steady doesn't mean that you need to use a steady flow. You can use it with strong on steady flows, as you have seen. But here you see that you start to add some inaccuracies in your resolution due to this hypothesis of steadiness. Okay, so see that instead on a steady, a steady solver. I see that in this case, the steady solver tends to underpredict a lot your your solution. So it's important also that in the steady solvers you cannot compute frequencies because you don't have time information. Instead, here this one will be time accurate. Pay attention that here I'm plotting in function of iterations, okay? I cannot plot a steady solution in function of time because you don't have the, that time dimension. Okay, and then let, we're going to talk about the time step that we're going to choose. So in CFD, we talk about something CFL number that at the end I will show you that. But see that CFL, larger CFL number means that you have larger time step, okay? So see that when you choose larger time step, you see that you start to lose some accuracy in your solution. And clearly also from this signal, see that we can compute the dominant frequency and you can get the shedding frequency and everything. But see that you start to add some error going from one to 50, okay? So large, large times that you will get a solution faster because you are using a larger time step, but you start to lose accuracy. So when you are running, also it's perfectly valid to do something like this. By the way, when you are running, you can control your time step, okay? So you can start with, in this case, you can start with a large time step or CFL number, and then you reduce it, okay? And when you are ready to start to do the sampling of the solution, you put it equal to one, that which is the ideal CFL number. You can also start with a small number, increase it, and then start to decrease it. It's up to you here to show you the, this progression, okay? And here you have the same for the least coefficient, but talking about the CFL number, okay? So this is the definition of CFL number. So it's the characteristic velocity times delta t, the time step, delta x is the dimension, the characteristic dimension of a cell. So this is local quantities in your mesh. You have an a mesh and each cell, you are going to know this value, this value, and you know the global time step, okay? <clears throat> so the CFL number is a measure of how much information you transverse a computational grid cell with the dimension delta x in a given time set delta t, 
Okay, so we can also talk about the CFL number condition, which is related to the CFL number, which is this. Okay, so this is in multiple dimensions. Okay, so in each dimension, you can, you can have different CFL numbers, okay, the delta x, but this will impose this condition, this maximum CFL number. So this is the maximum CFL number allowable by, by your numerical method. So in Fluent, the numerical methods that we're going to use are on condition of it, in the, in, unconditionally stable. This means that there is no requirement, strict requirements when it comes to the maximum allowable CFL number, but as we have seen, that is you use very large CFL numbers, you start to lose accuracy. So generally speaking, the time step and CFL number, because they are related, must be chosen in such a way that it resolves the time dependent features and maintains over accuracy. So this is better illustrated in, the, in this figure. So see that you have this behavior, the blue line, let's say that it will represent the real behavior and the numerical approximation, the approximation solution is will be the, the red line. So see that as you choose a large time step, you lose physics. Instead here, when you choose a small time step, you start to capture better that physics. So this is up to you as a user to choose this. So in some cases, you can go with a large time step. In some cases, that is unacceptable. Some cases, you can also start large and then go with a low, to a low uh, time step or CFL when you are ready to sample, okay? So all this can be controlled in the simulation. And this is the extra complexity that we add in our steady simulations. So just to end, I like to see the CFL number like this. Okay, it's the ratio between the speed of the PDE and the speed of the mesh. Okay, so it is a direct indication of the amount of information that propagates through one cell or many cells in one time step. So it will be something like that. Imagine that you have these three cells. So a CFL of one, basically in one time step, you will propagate this, the, that information in this singular cell. But if you choose a larger, larger CFL number, you are going to propagate in one single time step more information across these two cells. As you put it to the will be larger. Okay, you will propagate in more cells. Okay, so you start larger CFL number, you start to lose accuracy in the interface between the cells where you have the fluxes. Okay. So this is the, uh, the interpretation I like, I like to use. Okay. But generally speaking, remember large CFL numbers will add numerical diffusion just because you are propagating more information in, across the cells per single time step. Okay. So remember, choose wisely your CFL number. Okay, so if you want good accuracy, a good value is one. Okay, but probably up to five will be give you good accuracy. You start to go 10, 20, 50, you start to lose accuracy because you are propagating too much information across cells. So this is the presentation of the case. Okay, now let's move to geometry generation and so on. Uh, and see you in the next video. Bye.